Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are on season four episode, lucky number 13, Return to Grace. This episode first aired February 5th, 1996. Unlucky for Klingons, I'd say. (laughs) That's true. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about the previous episode, which was the Odo's in Love episode? No, it was perfect. Although not for Odo so much. No, he was pretty sad at the end. And also, it was a bad episode for hair. And I have to say, this episode, also not great for (laughs) hair. (laughs) You know, maybe in the season wrap-up, we should actually do a hair rating. Through the seasons? A master through the seasons hair rating. Yeah, good idea. Nothing can beat Vortex for bad hair. Well, that's true. That was a guest star's hair. I was thinking more like the main characters. Ah. Yeah, you know, we we only hit the important topics. This is important to the Star Trek fan base. Apparently. Well, to us anyway. Or maybe more specifically to me. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Should we get started on this episode? Absolutely. It seems like it's been forever since we recorded a DS9 podcast, even though we only took a week off. I know when we get out of the routine, it messes everything up. But anyway, we skipped a week. We're back. Yes, we're here. So in the cold open, Kira is on her way to a conference with the Cardassians to share Klingon intelligence. The doctor is giving her tons of vaccinations all at once because the Cardassian health system has collapsed due to the Klingon invasion and disease is running rampant. Worf comes in with a list of things that the Federation does not want to share with the Cardassians. Kira has a quick look at it before running from the room to throw up from all the vaccines. And I notice how Bashir doesn't seem terribly concerned about her reactions to all of this. No, well, it's part of the joke in this scene where yeah. she's seeing spots or something and he's like, good. So, yeah. Now she needs to hit the bathroom or throw up. Yeah, that's yeah, also good. She's throwing up. I think he needs to work on his empathy a little. He shows a lot of empathy in other situations when the person is sick and needs care. But when he just thinks, yeah, this is what happens, then he just doesn't seem to mind. Oh, yeah. Like, this is expected. Deal with it. <laughs> now we go to Kira packing for her trip when in comes my favorite character, Dukat. Oh, wait, I mean my least favorite character. I don't know why I don't like him. He's a great figure of Cardassian pride. He exhibits almost every trait that I dislike about him in this episode, so I think it will become clear. He's been demoted because of his Bajoran daughter, and he basically says it's all Kira's fault. And then he says he doesn't blame her. I mean, he's so annoying. That was just perfect, Dukat, before you convinced me. Oh, yeah, totally. It's somebody else's fault. Uh Uh-huh. Dukat is the victim in all of this, you realize. I know. And the way he says that he doesn't blame her. Uh, I mean, he's just so full of it. Um, you just basically blamed her two seconds ago. Uh, Yeah. Do you have that much cognitive dissonance? This is just how he is. He's horrible. (laughs) It was funny that in such a short scene, you got so much of Dukat's character. Yeah. Well, anyway, he's now been relegated to ferrying freight and various foreign dignitaries like her. Yeah. Apparently, even his mother has disowned him and his wife has left him. But I mean, who cares? First of all, this is all your own fault. And secondly, your society sucks for being racist. So I don't feel bad for you. I will say I am surprised he didn't manage to leverage this whole incident to his benefit. But I guess maybe Cardassian politics still play very much the same way of they're all looking for something to bring down the guy above them. Mm, Yeah. And he wasn't able to deflect this. Yet. (laughs) He assures her that this is only a temporary setback in his career. Yep. And then he takes her bags and off we go. And we cue the theme song. The Great Ducat reduced to carrying Kira's bags. Carrying a Bajoran's bags. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's just like a taxi driver now. Now we go to the freighter and Kira is in her quarters going over info for the conference. One of the really funny things about Trek in the 90s is that they had data pads that yes. look a lot like iPads, right? Yeah. It was a very forward-looking device, but they can each only be used for one thing. And so she's got pads all over her desk right. <laughs> because it's like they're each an individual book or something. <laughs> they were on the right track. They were close, but yeah. they hadn't quite gotten to the point of these are multifunction devices. I know. I find that so funny. Dukat's half-Bajoran daughter, Zael, comes in, and it seems that she and Kira are already quite close, which is very cute, yes. she gives her a big hug. And Zael is wearing a purple outfit reminiscent of the Obsidian Order rep in the episode about the Defiant. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, yeah. 
Well, anyways, Ayel had a rough time on Cardassia because of the Bajoran ridges on her nose and the inherent racism. And now she travels around on the freighter with her father. And she mentions that her father was actually exiled. Do Kat fail to mention that to Kira earlier? Oh, what a surprise that he would keep something from her or say something that would make him look better. Right, right. Oh, yeah. I've been demoted. No, no, you've been exiled. You're like He's Garrick. Exactly. I was kind of surprised that Ducat appears to be acting like a father towards her. Do you think it's because his, well, his mother disowned him and his wife left him that Zyal ends up basically being the focus of his life, even now that he's been de- demoted? Yeah, I mean, it seems like she's all that he has left. Yeah. We haven't seen enough to know if, does he see something in her that reminds him of himself or something else that maybe is missing? But yeah, if she's all that he's got left and he was willing to give up all that other stuff for her, he wouldn't have gone home with her. It seems like a really odd contradiction. Yeah, it's not necessarily believable. Unless he is actually so enamored with Kira, he had to do something that made Kira happy, which is gross. Yeah, I see what you mean. Could be that though. And I assume Kira must have had some contact with Zial since she went back. Yeah, because they give each other a big hug, so maybe they were communicating. Right. Having FaceTime calls. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Well, while they're talking, a battle drill alarm goes off, surprising Kira. So we go to the bridge, and the very small crew on this freighter is trying to make Dukat happy by having a fake battle with an asteroid or something. But it's a slow old freighter, and Dukat is very cranky about their performance. (laughs) Yes. He's obviously trying to recapture his military days. Right. Well, it's the way Kira says as well. On a freighter? Yeah, and then he kind of snaps at her, and then he apologizes immediately and invites her to dinner, which she reluctantly agrees to. I mean, just say no. Why encourage him? Or invite Zael to come along. Yeah, because Kira was just trying to give him some advice about if he wants to run a military ship, how to make it run a little bit better. And he was pretty snappy. But seeing as how close he is to the Badlands, you think he could have got some weapons from the Cardassian settlers or the Marquis, because, you know, they all hype up their ships and add extra weapons and things. If Ducat wants this freighter to be a bit more like a a warship, do something like that. I don't think the Cardassians are very good at thinking outside the box. Well, that's one of the things that comes out in this episode is Kira tells him he's got to stop thinking the same way and stop acting the same way and, you know, be a little bit more creative. And that's just something he's never had to do before. Okay. Although I think that's also a television trope. That's true, but it does fit as a trait of the Cardassians generally. It does, yeah. Because they'd rather just blame somebody else rather than come up with a creative idea. Right. You go through the manual, and if whatever it said in the manual didn't work, it's somebody else's fault. Find someone to blame. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Cardassian 101. And when Ducat says, this is a military vessel and will be run in a military manner, he's just hanging on to that one scrap of pride. Oh, by saying that it's this isn't a military ship? Yeah, it's a freighter. Yeah, he's definitely clinging to something that's not there anymore. Maybe a little bit like Garrett clinging to oh. being in the Obsidian Order, which apparently doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah. Well, now Ducat is plying Kira with Bajoran wine at dinner. He claims to not regret saving Zael, and then he starts asking Kira about Barail and Shakar, and he does two really gross things here. One, he says she obviously likes powerful men, so that's an incentive for him to get his rank back. I mean, gross. (laughs) And two, he tells her about all the other women that Shakar had had relationships with during the resistance, and it is not the way to endear yourself to another person. It's so perfectly fitting for Dukat. Why wouldn't he be irresistible? Yeah, and also the only thing he knows how to do is to tear down other people. It's hard to describe how unattractive that is (laughs) from the other person's point of view. I mean, it's really just awful. It's also a little bit abusive because you're undermining my decisions. And I mean, I just, I really react badly to stuff like this. I think that's just Cardassians. Well, it's certainly his way, but I guess... Garrick might do the same thing. Uh, Interesting. So maybe it is the Cardassian way. I don't know. I don't like it. That's what I'm trying to say. So yet again, okay, (laughs) we've exhibited another trait that I do not like about Gul Dukat. Wow, we've had like two in this episode and we're only like 10 minutes in. Only (laughs) two? He's been in two scenes. <laughs> He's made me so unhappy. But Kira does respond with a fantastic burn. Oh, yeah. When he tells her that their intelligence reports from back in the day were filled with details of Shakar's conquests. She replies with, that's what you kept track of? No wonder you lost. (laughs) (laughs) That is a good burn, yeah. 
Also, I'm impressed that Kira just didn't rise to any of this bait. No, she really didn't. She's learned a lot in the last couple of seasons. Exactly. And the yeah. earlier Kira, this would have driven her nuts. Yeah. You could almost argue it's a little inconsistent with her that she never really rose to it at all. She does get to the point where she snaps a little. Yeah. But even when she snaps, she's very measured. I'm going to take the opinion that it is because she has learned how to deal more in a political environment. Mm. And maybe she's learned by this point that with someone like Ducat, a burn will be much more effective than getting angry with him. Well, we could really overanalyze this too and think about the clues that she's had that Ducat has this really grotesque attraction to her. Yes. That might actually change the way she looks at him. Yeah. And she might be in more of a reserved protective mode, like she's putting a protective shell around herself, yeah. sort of, to protect herself from this really horrible human being that she has no attraction to. Yeah. Yeah. So she's just sort of covering herself. So rather than fighting with him and maybe making it worse, this, I guess, is a female thing. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are... Yeah. Um, men who do this as well. But this is definitely a female trait where sometimes you just go into protective mode when you realize that you're maybe a little bit at risk. And that might be what she's doing here if you were really going to overanalyze it. I'm not sure that the people writing this are aware of something like that. Right. But that's a possibility if we think back to like civil defense. Yes. Oh, when yeah. Garrick yeah. said, oh, my God, stop posturing to her. She's not attracted to you, right? <laughs> she could very well have been like, oh my God, that's why he keeps trying to spend time with me and having these stupid conversations yeah. with me. And that could have prompted her to start speaking to him differently. Oh, excellent point. Okay, I like that. There's my overanalysis. One thing I would wonder, he made a comment at the beginning of this scene where he said that the Bajoran wine is one of the things he misses the most. Yeah. And I thought murdering Bajorans was the biggest uh, thing he missed. And torturing them. Yeah. It made them stronger, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he knows. <laughs> Well, another alarm goes off, and on the bridge we learn that the Klingons attacked the outpost that they were taking Kira to, and they're not reading any life signs. A Klingon bird of prey decloaks in front of them, scans them, and then moves away because the freighter is no threat to them. That really irritates Dukat, because yep. he wants to pick a fight. Yeah, they've totally destroyed the outpost, so they've killed all the Bajorans and the Cardassians that were there. Yep. Kira tries to talk him out of attacking, but he fires at them anyway, and it makes no difference, and the Klingons just fly away unharmed, and Dukat's ego is hurt. Yeah. Kira tells him, you'll get us all killed, but he fires anyway. Because he's an idiot. He really is. They totally forgot to put makeup on his hands in this episode, oh, and he's really? constantly got his hands up by his face. Yeah. And it's so jarring, the different color of his skin with the makeup. That's funny. I did not notice that. Oh, it's really obvious. Way back in that Cardassians episode that happened in one scene I noticed with Garrett, yeah. but I haven't noticed it since, but it's really blatant here. Oh, funny. Either that or the Cardassians' skin color stops at the chest. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a natural thing. Everywhere else, they're just human flesh colored. <laughs> I don't know how you could make that more insulting for cat. They didn't even return fire. They just ignored them and went to warp. Yeah, like an annoying gnat. Yeah. Ducat says they must inform Central Command that these Klingons have been operating behind their lines with impunity. Someone has to stop them. And then he like pauses and says, someone else. Oh, meaning he can't do it? Yes. I was surprised when Kira says, we can go after them? Kira proposes they go after the Klingon ship, but first take a disruptor from the destroyed outpost and turn it into a weapon that they can use. Her thought is to clear out the cargo bay, and when Ducat protests, she tells him... He has to stop thinking like a military officer and start thinking like a resistance fighter. She eventually talks him into it, and then he very grossly praises her. Every time he does that, I get the creeps. Yeah. Innovation and adaptation are really not Cardassian traits. Well, also she implies that he's thinking about his own profit, because there's some profit to come from all this cargo. Yeah. She's like, yeah, you got to stop thinking about that and start thinking about how to fight. That's also kind of stupid. They would put their military effectiveness behind making some profit. Well, this is why they're a mess. This yeah. is why they lost so easily to the Klingons. Yeah. I mean, they barely managed to hold them off. Yeah, because the Klingons don't care about any of that stuff. All they want to do is fight and win. And the Cardassians have all this other political nonsense going on, and they can't even make logical right. decisions. There is no honor in profit. There's no honor in any of it. Now we're testing our new weapon, and it seems to work. When Ducat has this big grin on his face, Kira says, why is it when you smile, I want to leave the room? <laughs> Same. 
He thinks it's his overwhelming charm, which, oh my goodness. See, it's that. Uh, he has no concept of why he isn't just attractive to everyone. Yeah, that's totally true. But he says he's smiling because destroying that bird of prey will actually help restore his reputation. Then he starts poking at Kira about Shikar again, and finally she tells him off. She wants to keep their conversations on business. When she complains that he doesn't know how to talk to her, he says something like, oh, but you don't understand me. Like, you know, it's her oh, fault. He is so slimy. Well, but it's also so typical of a misogynistic creep. Yeah. Like, you're wrong. I'm awesome. You just have to understand me. This is all your fault. Ah. Uh... Oh, so gross in this whole episode. I know yeah. you think this. <laughs> I know you told me how pivotal this episode was after I watched it. And all I could think was, oh, my God, but it's so gross. There's so <laughs> much disgusting stuff from Ducat. That's all that I could think about. Well, I think it's really showing up ultimately what a degenerate Ducat is. Yeah. And the other thing in this scene is he tells Kira that he does care about his people. Uh huh. And I think he needed to add at the end there, if it's in my interests to do so. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like everything he says, his motivations are so impure. No, I think that's true. He's really just concerned with getting his old job back. But the trouble is his job doesn't really exist when the empire is crumbling. Yeah. So he's got to figure out how to get the Cardassian Empire back up and running so that he can be important again. I'm sure that he really feels quite adrift as things are sort of collapsing around him. But yeah. it's not that I feel sorry for him. Right. He's got no ability to adapt because his ego is too big. His ego is in yes. the way of everything. I have some more to say on this in overanalysis. Okay. Well, now we go to Kira trying to teach Zayel how to use a phaser rifle. She says she understands why Kira doesn't like her father. Do you? <laughs> And then she says, he wouldn't admit this to anyone else, but he thinks the occupation was a mistake. And she has a hard time seeing a murderer when she looks at her father. But Kira says she has a hard time seeing anything else. Right. Kira is not going to be your new stepmom. Kira is honest when she says to Zayal, no, she does not like her father. <laughs> I'm glad she's honest about it, and she should be. Yeah. Kira thinks Dukat wants forgiveness from her, and she's like, he's never going to get that. I mean, how could she possibly forgive him? <laughs> for this. This is the whole delusional side of Ducat. And I don't think this is just Ducat. I think there is a large proportion of the Cardassians who think this way that yeah. genuinely believe the propaganda that what they were doing on Bajor was right, that yeah. it made the Bajorans better. They didn't do anything wrong when we were there. It was all for the Bajorans' good. Yeah. I would say it goes even more beyond telling themselves lies. They genuinely believe it's absolutely unquestionably the truth. No, it's classic justification for abuse. Yeah. Did somebody writing this stuff actually have an abusive family history or something? Maybe. I mean, I hope not, because that's awful, but that's certainly what it reminds me of. Yeah. Finally, in summary, it's impossible for someone like Kira to forgive Ducat. Yes. He ran Bajor. He ran the occupation. Yep. It isn't forgiveness. You need to bring him to justice. Yeah, I agree. And it's kind of sad that Zial is getting fed the propaganda. Yeah. It, you know, it's true. In some ways, it reminds me of the music box. How could my father be a war criminal? Yeah. I find that scene probably one of the most interesting. Where she says she doesn't see a murderer when she sees her father. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand. Well, Ducat and Kira are trying to figure out where the Klingon ship is looking to attack next. Eventually, they figure out that it's a secret weapons research installation. They only need one good shot from their new disruptor. They decide to act as bait by faking their cargo and making it seem like they're carrying refined dilithium. My note here says Ducat turns the creepiness up to 11. Yeah, he tries complimenting her again, and she rebuffs his gross nonsense for the millionth time. And then they head off to the next location to wait for the Klingon ship. So now they're lying in wait and Dukat just keeps talking and talking and talking and talking and doing that <laughs> thing where he just likes the sound of his own voice as we have covered in a couple of previous episodes. Oh, I've forgotten what Cisco said about that. Yes. <laughs> he starts talking about what he'll do when he's restored to his military position. And you see more of, and I don't think just Dukat, I think you see more of the Cardassian mindset. This guy is running a freighter and he's making plans for his revenge against upcoming officers on yeah. Cardassia. 
Ducat, I think, encapsulates so much of what's wrong with Cardassian society and why they're having so much trouble now with a civilian government, because so much of this is like baked in. No, I totally agree. It it just made me laugh of like, you're running a freighter, dude, and you're planning your master plan. Yeah. Well, when the Klingon ship finally appears, Ducat thankfully shuts up. So the Klingons scan them and appear interested in their fake cargo. Yep. They call to say that they're confiscating the freighter and its cargo. When they lock on a tractor beam, Ducat waits until they're dramatically close to the bird of prey before firing the new weapon. They do a lot of damage to the Klingon ship, but they still get fired upon. While the Klingons are scrambling to fight back, the Cardassians and Kira beam over to the Klingon ship, and Kira quickly manages to beam the remaining Klingons back over to the burning freighter, (laughs) and they take over the bird of prey. I love it when Kira says, I'd like to see the Klingon captain explain this to his superiors. (laughs) Well, and she says it was easy because she knew the Klingon transporter codes. Oh. I'm not so sure this makes sense, but the whole scene was very cool. It was like a heist movie. Yes. So they've managed to do a full swap of crews between the ships, and Ducat presses a button, destroying the freighter and killing all of the Klingons. Yeah. And Kira is like, was that really necessary? I'm going to disagree with Kira and say, yes, that was actually necessary. The Cardassians are at war with the Klingons. Yeah. That is a battle experience captain and his crew. You can't let them just get away and get another ship and come back. Yeah, that's true. And they did just kill a whole bunch of people. Exactly. Including Bajorans. Yeah. That again, I think, is that Federation viewpoint of the universe starting to affect Kira. Well, I imagine she wasn't thinking of just letting them go. She was probably thinking that they would tractor them back to the station or something or take them prisoner. Oh, okay. That's a good point. I would have been surprised if she thought they should just go free. The other point is, if they let the captain go... Yeah. Martok would probably have him killed for failing in his duties. Well, that's probably true. It was pretty dishonorable. Well, yes, that was very dishonorable how they ended up back on the freighter. First of all, they let a freighter blow him up and then and then they lost control of their ship really quickly. I think the final thing in this scene, Ducat does manage to get a dig at Kira. You know, after she asks, was it necessary? He says, you're the terrorist. You tell me. There's the Ducat we know and love. Mm. Ducat is like... Well, this is quite a prize, the first Klingon bird of prey ever captured by Cardassia. Kira says there's a bigger prize in the ship's computer, the targets of all the Klingon raiders in Cardassian space. Ducat wants to call Cardassia and start gloating, so he decides he's going to call the head of the council directly. Mark Alimo does such a great job with Ducat. You can almost see him physically puffed up. Oh, yes. How he manages to portray that is just remarkable because he he does this, the body language and everything. You can just see it. You are perfectly portraying probably one of the most awful characters in all of Star Trek. (laughs) Maybe he relates to the ego. So they're trying to get the Klingon ship repaired when Dukat returns to the bridge, standing in the shadows. Turns out the new head of the government doesn't want to use all the data on the ship to attack. They want to engage in diplomatic negotiations instead. They have called him back to his military advisor position, but he's annoyed about being an advisor to a government that isn't interested in fighting. He says the Cardassians are a beaten people because they're afraid to lose what little they have left. He thinks he's the only one left to stand against the Klingons, which seems ridiculous. Yeah. She tells him that he can't fight the entire empire on his own, but he figures others will join him eventually. Wow. In the scene, he does say that the Bajorans beat the Cardassians with less weaponry than his ship. But Kira is like, it's not the same. We were united. He wants her to join him as a Cardassian resistance fighter. Yeah. I mean, he's just clueless about her, right? He has no idea. He has no idea. None. He doesn't understand the world outside of his narrow window of thinking. He tries saying that if Cardassia falls, Bajor is next. I mean, that might be the one thing that convinces her. Yeah. Damar interrupts them before she can answer. Like, we're supposed to believe that she's really considering it, but, you know, she's not. He says, this gives you a chance to do what you were meant to do, as he continues to try to recruit her. He doesn't understand she never wanted that job. This wasn't what a you were meant to do. This was something she was forced into. Yeah, totally different. Yeah. She just happened to be good at it. It wasn't because it was her calling in life to be a terrorist. Right. This is such a strange scene because Ducat says the Bachorans beat them. Yes. I took note of that. I don't think he's ever quite said that out loud before. 
Oh, he's lying. He's completely lying. There's no way Ducat thinks that the Cardassians lost. Yeah. He's trying to recruit Kira in a really clumsy way. And I think this is something the Cardassians would do, certainly internally, that they would just lie to each other to get their way. Yeah. I imagine it might be something that yeah. Garrick or someone in the order would do to get what they right, wanted. Right. Yeah. Manipulate the conversation. But yes. he's not quite good enough at it. Because he's still stuck in his own ego. Right. Yeah, you could see Garrick doing that and probably being able to pull it off. Yeah. I'm just picturing Garrick saying, if we only had somebody on board who was experienced at this. Which wouldn't work either. <laughs> Later, Zael tries to show Kira how tough she is, but it doesn't work. And Kira takes her down easily. Zael needs training if she's going to go with her father. But Kira doesn't think that she can be ruthless. Well, she asks Kira to help train her. She does. Later on the bridge, Kira is telling Dukat to take his offer and shove it. I mean, that's not what she said, but that's what she said in my head. She's already lived that life that he's now choosing, and she doesn't want to do it anymore. She tells him that Zael should come to the station instead of going on this fight with him. She says Zael reminds her of herself, and she doesn't want her to go through what she went through. He asks her, weren't you even tempted? And she immediately says, no. No, she's not tempted by this guy. Yeah. He he sees something completely different from what reality is. We head back to the station, surprising Cisco and crew by turning up in a Klingon bird of prey. <laughs> yes. Dukat has decided to let Zael stay with Kira, and he tells her, whether you like it or not, our lives have become deeply intertwined. Oh, great. She's like, that seems to please you. He says it gives him a reason to live, which, oh my God. It gives me a reason to not want to watch the show, but I'll put up with it. Those are just words from Ducat. I guess so. The end. Well, so much here. So much for you to overanalyze. <laughs> yes. All right, go. First thing, right at the end where Ducat asks her, why do you care so much? And Kira says, because she reminds me of herself. And she doesn't want Zael to go through what Kira experienced, which is right. definitely a potential for Zael. I don't think Duquette really understands her motivation. No, oh, no. No, not at all. This comes back to what we talked about earlier is you know, why he was being a father. I look at Duquette's relationship with Zayal as he sees her almost as a possession. She's something that's his. And maybe that's the Cardassian version of loving your children. Remember in that episode, Tribunal, yeah. when they kept showing... The couple of Cardassians standing out in the street and the things being brought, the propaganda <laughs> being broadcast to everyone. Yes. They were saying something in that recording like, look to the children, they're the future, right? Yeah. So if they're purely looking at their children as something that they need to program, kind of protect from reality, but program oh. to think, yeah. feel, and behave a certain way so that when they do get to adulthood, they're like Garrick. Yeah. The never-ending sacrifice. Exactly. They believe in all of that as the right way to do things. Oh. If they really do look at their children that way, as things that they're trying to program and control, then what Kira said would make no sense to him. Yeah. Because what she is thinking is, I didn't get my childhood. It was taken from me by you, you and your people. Yeah. So she's saying, let's let Zael have her childhood, at least what's at this point, what's left yeah. of it. She's not a child anymore. Become her own person without programming. Yes. Give her an opportunity to make her own decisions. Yeah. She's looking at it in just such the polar opposite way from yeah. how they seem to be telling all of Cardassia to look at their children. There's no reason that would make sense to him because it's just such the opposite. Right. But if he were really buying into it, he would not let her go with Kira. Interesting. Because he would want to do this thing. He would want to turn her into it. I mean, maybe it's shaken now because he's watching Cardassi kind of crumble around him and maybe he's just, you know, not that true believer anymore. Maybe he feels like I got to build it back up and then I can bring her back into it. Uh, but I think the other part of it is yeah. Maybe it's not that. And this is just a really gross way he can stay connected to Kira. And that's really upsetting. That would also be a motivation for him. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. That's a good take. Yeah. Okay. That's my overanalysis of your overanalysis. <laughs> right, next thing. Yeah. Ducat believes the rhetoric. He believes the Empire is strong. He believes the Empire is noble, that everybody follows it. And I think this breaks him. 
I see him as a true believer yeah. in the same way as Garrick. The difference is, because of the exile, what's happening on Cardassia doesn't, if you like, affect Garrick. He's not living with the reality. He can sort of still have this rose-tinted view of what Cardassia is. Dukat is actually living through the collapse of the Cardassian Empire because yeah. it's always been super fragile. Yes. The resources they were stealing from Bajor were clearly keeping the Cardassian Empire staggering along. Right. The paint over rust. <laughs> it's so fragile. When the Obsidian Order goes, everything goes with it. Yeah. Dukat, having lived and breathed that rhetoric, we get to a point where he's actually in a position to fight. And the noble Cardassian Empire, which can drive the Klingons out. Yeah. And the government, who's having to live with the reality of they probably don't have enough ships, they probably don't have enough troops, they probably don't yeah. have enough people with experience, is saying, yeah. we're going to negotiate our way out of this. It's the opposite of everything he believed. This is why I always say I'm surprised by the collapse of the order didn't have more an effect on Garrick. And I think it's because he has so much difference. And whereas Ducat, who's in the middle of it, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. I was thinking that in his mind, it was collapsing because the military wasn't in charge of it anymore. Yeah. And now they had the civilian government. He was willing to change his loyalties to keep his job, to keep his rank, to keep himself in an important position. But he always probably was thinking that the military was still going to run everything, yeah. right? They're still going to listen to us. And now maybe he's starting to recognize that when he said that thing about, I'm the only one who can fight them. This, again, is his ego out of control, <laughs> but it's probably being fed by this story, yeah. which is that, well, we're weak because the military is no longer in charge of the government. And now it's all these people who don't want to fight and they're not, they don't believe in the right things. Oh, it's everybody else's fault. Exactly. That's where I was going. So, of course, it's somebody else's fault. And the original ideals that we had in Cardassia, those are the right ones. And I alone am going to take us back to them. Wow. Yes. <laughs> That's the way that I was yeah. thinking he was thinking. Yeah. He's living the view of a world that doesn't exist. Yeah. And I don't feel like he's broken yet, but I do feel like he's breaking. Yeah. Like things are cracking. He's on the way there. Yeah. And you mentioned Garrick and... I mean, I agree with you. It it looks different to him because he's not been living in the middle of it for so long. I mean, he struggled when he heard about the order collapsing, but really all that changed for him was he lost his contacts. Yeah. He started losing touch with what was going on there. It's not that he watched it crumble around him like Ducat yeah. did. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I agree. It's different for him. Okay. On to a slightly lighter note. So, ZL living on the station. I kept thinking of the TNG episode with Data's daughter. A friend for Garrick. <laughs> A friend for war. <laughs> yes, good point. Oh, that will really annoy Ducat if she hangs out with Garrick. Yes. Well, because as the other Cardassian on the station, I would expect Garrick would very much like to impart some of his wisdom. Uh, probably, yeah. Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Next thing, I kind of laughed at Kira going over the weapons when she's explaining them to Zial. And oh, the yeah. difference between the Cardassian disruptor and the Federation rifle. It's kind of a nod at the eternal debate over the US M16 and the AK-47, of which is the better rifle. And the AK-47 is supposed to be able to fire with mud in the barrel, and the M16 is a piece of precision engineering. And I thought that was kind of funny, that the Federation would engineer complex piece of machinery. Yeah, I mean, I'll have to take your word for it <laughs> on that topic. It's not a topic I would look into or pay any attention to. Yeah. But yeah, they were clearly making a point that you need the weapon that works yeah. and the one that you can rely on. The one that is much more complicated and you have to think about too much might get you killed. Exactly. Exactly. She's being very pragmatic. Yeah. Okay. Next thing. And this might be the final one. Okay. Why isn't the Federation helping Cardassia more? An autocratic government has been overthrown. Cardassia is obviously suffering from a collapse of its health system. It's suffering from obviously military problems of Klingons operating behind their lines, cloaking and destroying bases and things that are important. Yeah. The Federation was more than happy to help the Bajorans. Why would they not be helping the strategically more important Cardassians, especially when the Klingons have now backed out of the Kitimura Accords? are openly aggressive, if Cardassia falls to the Klingons, 
Bejor is next. And then where do they go from there? Again, it seems like they're almost following this appeasement route of not confronting the problem head on. Cardassia is not in the Federation. No, neither is Bejor. And we've established that we only help people we like. <laughs> oh, okay. There's my mistake. And the Cardassians did some horrible, brutal things. And they don't help Bejor that much. Anytime there's any kind of problem, they're always like, oh, we can't do that. Can't interfere. Prime directive. They've done a few things for them. Yeah. But I argue they don't help that much. But strategically, I think you almost have to. Oh, I agree. Strategically, it doesn't make sense for them to let Cardassia and then Bajor yeah. fall. They haven't made this point for a while, which is that DS9 is way out on the edge of interest for them. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they don't have a ton of other things going on around there, right? There's, yep. There doesn't seem to be any other planets that they're interested in. So they just kind of let that go. And what's so funny about that is even Earth history and by this point has shown, even if you take this approach of, oh, this is just things happening a long way away. It's not going to affect us. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't affect you until it's on your doorstep. Well, that's what I was going to say. That was kind of the, the direction I was going. Which is, this is really historically an American way of looking at things. If I just don't pay attention to it, that thing way over there is going to go away. And then eventually it ends up not going away and something <laughs> terrible happens. And then we get involved and then we're like, oh, gee, we should have done that sooner. Yeah. You know, or, or it's more it's more like, oh, gee, aren't we the heroes? It's like, oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> so to me, it's kind of an American way of looking yeah. at this. But an old school one. Yeah. No, I think strategically, I agree with you. It's a mistake to let Cardassia and then Bajor fall, especially with the wormhole right in the middle yeah, there. Yeah, right. Because now you are really gambling with your future. Right. Because what if the Klingons then forge some kind of alliance with the Jem'Hadar and the Dominion? Well, they're both warrior races. Yeah, it seems unlikely. <laughs> But there's also that crazy thing, we've talked about it a few times, where when you're living in paradise and you're just thinking, oh, let the terrible people destroy each yeah. other. And I keep thinking that their thought is, God, the Cardassians are horrible. So what if the Klingons destroy them? Yeah. And then the Jem'Hadar starts coming through and great. Either the Jem'Hadars <laughs> will destroy the Klingon or the Klingon will destroy the Jem'Hadar. One or the other. And then at least we'll be down to one problem. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think you're right in that there's strategic negligence going on because nobody wants to make a decision. Right. I would agree with your summary there as well. That's my new phrase, strategic negligence. I, I should get that on a t-shirt. Oh, wow. DS9, strategic negligence. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even have to say DS9. <laughs> Just strategic negligence. Oh, okay. I like that. <laughs> the American way. Yeah. That will be available in a t-shirt from our online store if we had one. That's what I'll put on Patreon. And my final, final point. This is a Kira point. Okay. I don't think she really understands Dukat. No. He's a Cardassian military officer. In the same way, when she and Odo observed Garrick just kill Entek, just straight up shot him and killed him. Both of them were surprised in that scene. She doesn't really get that Cardassian side of things, of killing is just part of the job. And you've seen this with Kira when she's talked about her struggle with the yeah. things that she did and living with the things that she did. That's where I say she doesn't necessarily understand that mindset of these military races that are like, we just kill people. That makes sense in terms of the story. Yeah. Because why would he be able to understand her any better than she would be able to understand him? Realistically, nobody understands anybody when they don't have their background because we're all different and we all go through different experiences. He's been through something different in terms of the propaganda that he was yes. raised on and then the world that he has lived on yeah. and protected. And then also his ego is a creation of the times and the world that he lives in. And he has been built up to this point that he's at now. And she has absolutely no way of being able to relate to that. She just knows he's horrible and he's done horrible things. So she's going to make all of her own assumptions. The truth is in the reverse. He can't understand why she thinks that Zael should not live the way that she lived yeah. because he thinks she's such a good resistance fighter. Clearly, this is what she was meant to do. Yeah. So why would she want to fight that? Why wouldn't you want to? Exactly. So he can't relate to the way that she's thinking or the future that she's trying to build for herself because that's just not the way that he was raised. Yeah. So then, yeah, what you're saying makes sense. They can't really relate to each other. And that's really what this entire episode is about. 
Yeah. Well, I think the other dynamic here is Kira is an individual who is prepared to change and learn and expand. Yeah. And Dukat within Cardassian society. He's in yeah. his box and he stays there. Interesting. Yeah. I think my arguments, I mean, we're not really arguing. Um, Discussion. I think the reason that I'm kind of struggling here in talking about this episode is what I'm going to say in my women in the future <laughs> section that I'm stuck on. Yeah. <laughs> that might make it make some sense. And that wraps it up for my over analysis. Okay, let's move to women in the future. Okay. I would just like to go on record that if anything had ever happened romantically between Dukat and Kira throughout this entire series, I would have absolutely lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I read somewhere, sometime, I don't know, that... There was maybe a plan for that to happen, for them to get together, or maybe it was just what the actor, Mark Alimo, wanted. I, I don't know. But somewhere I read that it doesn't happen, which is good, because, I mean, I would just absolutely riot if that had happened. I do not like the endless creeping that Dukat does to Kira, but I like the fact that she never wavers, because that just would make no sense. That would be so horrifying to watch. I didn't like how they kind of wanted us to think maybe she was waffling. You know, maybe she really kind of was thinking about it. But, you know, she, she didn't in the end. So I'll give them credit for that. And also there was just nothing awful, like on that episode <laughs> Defiant, where Tom Riker kisses her at the end. And I was just like, what is happening? If that had happened here, I think I would have been done with this show forever. <laughs> I don't think I could have recovered from something so horrible because there's so many examples in entertainment of women like getting over abuse and getting together with a man who has done something horrible to them. And it would have been really hard to watch that here. And I'm glad to know that it doesn't happen. But if I didn't know that, I would be freaking out by this episode <laughs> that they were trying to tell me it was coming. You would be worried that that was on the horizon. I would be very, very worried that, yeah. So in this particular case, I'm happy to have a spoiler because I'm just not going to freak out about it. So I think that's good news. I appreciate the fact that they didn't waver with Kira, that they didn't give in to that impulse for whatever the reason was. I'm glad that they didn't do it. But the character of Dukat, I find really hard to watch. All that sort of creeping he does on her and that nonsense of tearing down her current boyfriend and all that stuff. That is something that really terrible people do. I've seen it in my life. It's awful. And so I just find him so hard to watch. I've seen many people on Reddit in particular who tell me that Kai Wynn is so much worse than Dukat. I don't know the future story. Maybe Kai Wynn is going to do something that's so horrible it's worse than anything Dukat has ever done. But from my perspective up till this point, I could watch Kai Wynn in every episode. I cannot watch Dukat. I'm so distracted by... <laughs> by all of these gross things that they have him do. It's not just the awful thing that he did in history. It's what they show him do now. I just, ugh, he is so grosses me out. Well, I think the difference is Kai Wynn is a sociopath who is a yeah. climber and wants to get to the top of the pole. Dukat is an abuser. Yeah. So anyway, that's my women in the future section. I'm glad that Kira came out the other side with I don't know, her integrity intact, I guess. Yes. I mean, I don't think last week when she was just so clueless to Odo and his just absolute devotion and love for her and she just doesn't see it. I don't think that was accurate. I think she would at least notice it and be a little bit more empathetic to it. It didn't fit with it. it just no, it didn't fit. And, you know, this did. This did work. Yeah, I think for her. OK. I don't have anything really to say about Zael. She's not that interesting of a character yet. She's Well, she's not being developed. She's kind of being written like a kid, yeah. but she's older than that. But at the same time, she really hasn't had an opportunity to grow. And maybe that's what she'll get yeah. on the station. Although it's not a great place for kids to grow. But anyway. <laughs> hey, it turned out Jake and Nog. <laughs> yeah, she can hang out with Jake now because he doesn't have Nog anymore. But okay, let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Okay, I will preface this with... This is one of those episodes that, yeah. for whatever reason, just stuck in my head. Wow. It's an absolute thumbs up. I remember watching it back in the time and going, wow, this is great. This is important to the story. It's important to yeah. the direction of the show. And it's important to the characters. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I can definitely see we're setting ourselves up for something. Yes. 
what they've done with Ducat, it makes sense. Yep. He's basically standing up saying, I'm the only one who can do this, or I'm the only one who's willing to stand up for Cardassia. And he's puffing out his chest and he's trying yep. to do something big. And, you know, he is talking about standing up against the entire Klingon Empire by himself, or at least finding others to do it and trying to rebuild that Cardassian military, right. probably again with others. And also, I think it's important that Zael has this opportunity to spend time with Kira. Maybe she'll be able to spend some time on Bajor and she won't be as rejected there. I don't know. Some good opportunities there, I think, for her to grow. It is intriguing to think about Garrick spending some time with Zael, but yeah. I don't know if that will happen and maybe not a great use of time for that character. The note that I have under rating in my notes, it says, I don't know what the heck to do with this episode. <laughs> I don't know what rating to give it. There are some things I liked about it. The stuff I talked about in Women in the Future of Kira just not wavering. I think that was really solid. And I like the decision to bring Zael back with her to the station. I thought that was yeah. good. And I also thought it was cool that she was just like telling him that he had to think differently. He had to now start thinking like a resistance fighter. And she was able to show the value that she had in so many ways as a fighter, but also still reject it. So I liked all of those things. But I find Ducat so difficult to watch. Yeah. And all of that creeping that he did was really horrible. If I were watching Bashir do all that creeping, I would have given this a thumbs down in season one. Yeah. So I sit on the fence, you know, oh. because of all of that. I'm going to give it a neutral. Really? But if I looked back on this episode a year from now and I said to myself, do I want to watch that episode again? And no, no, thank you. <laughs> Which typically ends up dumping these down lower when yeah, yeah. we rank all the episodes. So that's probably what's going to happen. I'm going to give it a break by putting it in the middle. Okay. Definitely not part of the Ducat fan club here. I am not. Okay, that is it for season four, episode 13. Come back next week for episode 14. Another episode that I could pretty much tell you everything that happened in it without rewatching. Is Ducat in it? Ducat is not in it. Okay, then I'm in. <laughs> In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own overanalysis of this or any episode, or if you'd like to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram at rebingeit. And you can go to talkthroughmedia.com where you can leave feedback for individual episodes. And more importantly, you can listen to our new podcast, Star Trek Prodigy, a rebingeit podcast, where we talk about the new animated series, Prodigy. And you can also listen to any of the other podcasts on the network. We cover all the shows. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. Bye.